speaker for this session today is Sinead Hammerston, Species Conservation Project Coordinator um, for Southwest Australia, WWF Australia. And now I just have to go on things. There we go. Thanks so much, Sinead. Thank you. G'day everyone. Um, so I'm based in Perth. Um, I work for WWF. I'm, um, as you said, Species Conservation Project Coordinator for South West Australia. Now that's a big mouthful, but basically it's my job to develop conservation projects and pull partners together to seek funding and really make things happen on the ground. And the key to success really is partnerships. Um, I always start by talking to partners and seeing where the synergies are between what they're trying to achieve and what I'm trying to achieve and seeing how we can work together. And of course, if everybody can contribute a little bit, then we can use that, put that together and use that to leverage a lot more funding and make things happen. So the Rare Flora Search and Rescue Project, partnering with community volunteers, is a partnership project between WWF, the community, the Wildflower Society of WA and the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions. I had to think about that because I keep changing their name. So I'll just call them DBCA throughout. <clears throat> so most of my slides are just photos of people in action actually doing the project. Um, so that's some volunteers from the Durian Bay group. Um, so why, do, why are we doing this project? Well, the southwest of WA is a biodiversity hotspot. It's a centre for plant diversity. We've got incredible amounts of amazing wildflowers, and there's still a lot we don't know anything about. So there's about a thousand species on the state lists of data deficient species that are the top two priorities, priority one and two species, meaning that they are um, considered to be rare and poorly known. They're only known from one or a couple of populations worldwide, but they're not protected. So we, don't, we haven't done enough searching to know, you know if they are rare and endangered or not. And this project is really about getting citizen, science, sorry, <laughs> citizen scientists on board to help us to really um, go through that list and work out what's rare, what do we need to be protecting, what's actually more common than we think but nobody's ever looked for it, and to try and sort out um, that process and basically because all of us have a funding issue there's so much conservation work that needs to be done we need to be making sure that we're spending the money in the right place um, and also um, before any of these species can be um, protected be nominated for listing under the EPBC Act we need to show enough evidence that enough search has been done some of my volleys from Durian Bay having a fantastic time. These ladies crack me up. It's always wonderful to get out in the field with them. Um, so I started uh, with a pilot project for this, um, for this project and just worked with the Durian Bay Regional Herbarium Group. Um, the herbarium groups were set up a long time ago when the WA Herbarium really wanted people out there just collecting everything that was around and the herbarium can no longer process those records. So there's a lot of these groups sitting there that are still keen, but they don't really have a direction. So our idea was to tap into those groups as well as others. So that was where we started. Um, so the volunteers in this group actually didn't have very much botanical knowledge at all. So I spent quite a long time working with them, um, going through characteristics of the target plants that we were searching for so that they would know how to find them. Um, and also just teaching them the basics of how to you know, search thoroughly so that we could you know, definitely mark those areas off as being searched. Um, and we provided them with equipment and support. Um, so as I said before, resources are the main limitation. Uh, DBCA obviously concentrates a lot more on species that are already listed, species and communities that are already protected. Um, so this was sort of a gap that we wanted to fill. Um, species information for these plants is really sketchy and I'll show you a bit more about that in a moment. Um, and also the, where to look, some information on likely habitat was missing, um, skills in some cases for volunteers and also equipment to make sure that people could collect good data properly and also do it safely. So we've got this really awesome resource in WA called Florabase. 
and this is run by the WA Herbarium and this is an example of a common species. So you can see you've got um, photos of different parts of the plant, you've got information, well you might not be able to read that, but anyway you've got information about you know that it's how tall it is, when it flowers, what colour the flowers are, what soils you might find it on and even a brief scientific description. So that's what we'd like to see. And this is an example of one of the species that we've been working on and you can see that there's just no information. There's nothing. So there's a little dot on a map and that's but all you've got to go on. It doesn't tell you whether it's a tree or a shrub or a vine. It doesn't tell you, you know, where you might find it, what soil, what it looks like, not even a photo. So that's what we're working with. These things are really poorly known. There's a real need for survey, but um, if somebody wanted to help look for it, they wouldn't know what to look for or even where to look. So from what we learned um, in the pilot, um, you know, more information is needed. There's so many species that we need to get information together for and get that out to our volunteers. Um, more specific search locations help. So in the pilot, uh, DVCA did some likely habitat mapping for us, which was fantastic. But we found um, with a small community group that was still a little bit nervous, um, didn't have the confidence, it was much better for us to really pick out exact small locations and give them a list so that then once they got going and built up their confidence, they could just go out every second weekend and start looking for these things, and that worked well. Um, recording information was still a problem, so we had given the group GPSs and you know data sheets and things like that, but there was still this sort of transfer of information to, um, to the flora conservation officers in the regions, and then there wasn't really a good database for where this information could sit especially if they didn't find anything. There was nowhere for that nil find information to sit. And so things were just sitting in people's files or on computers and that sort of stuff. So we needed to make sure we are making the most of search effort. Um, and it's a big area and there's a lot of plans to look for, so we needed some more help. So thanks to a, um, a large grant from the state NRM Community Capability Grants in Western Australia, um, we scaled the project up, so we incre increased the area that we covered. We're, we're now working in the Lazure Sand Plains, the Esperance area and the Eastern Wheat Belt areas. Um, and to meet the skills gap that we had and so that we could get some more, like get more done with less effort because we didn't have, you know, the resources, we specifically we sent out an EOI and specifically called for volunteers that had botanical experience. Um, and we thought we might have to, you know, advertise a bit, but it was the opposite. We were flooded with um, keen volunteers, which was awesome. So we were aiming for 50 volunteers, and uh, yeah, we currently have 105 volunteers registered for the project, and most of them are botanists or retired botanists, and a lot of them are working with other groups of people, so they're being the, the sort of instigator, I guess, and holding things together and teaching other people as they go along. Um, so there is a little bit of an issue with um, threatened species or priority species about sharing too much information, and I think part of that is the reason why it's lacking on the, on the internet. So to combat that, we've created these fact sheets for each species. And we just really went through any information that was available. And for some, there really wasn't much. So if there was a photo anywhere, we used that. Um, we took scans of the herbarium specimens. Uh, we, we talked to expert botanists and you know, people who knew people that had seen the plant and just gathered any information together that we could so that we could give our volunteers as much, you know, arm them with as much material as we could. Um, and we also did some likely habitat mapping and includes, included some of that specific site search information on there. So we've done that for 25 species and we're working on another 25. So that covers the what and where. Um, as we've heard about in this um, conference, everybody's got an app for their project. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, to collect the information in a, in a more streamlined way and to make sure that it was accessible for the future, uh, DVCA actually adapted an existing collector tool app that they were using for other projects for us. And so using this app, um, we met a little bit of resistance, particularly from the older volunteers about learning to 
you know, to interface with something new, and I completely understand that. I'm absolutely technologically challenged, but even I could learn how to use this very quickly and easily, and with a bit of support, some classroom sort of training sessions, and then in the field support, our, all our volunteers uh, have got on board with it um, and found that it's actually a way quicker and easier process than to try to get the GPS to work and then... Um, you know, recording everything and then trying to transcribe that into something else and getting somebody to put it somewhere useful. So this collector tool app, you can just draw on the screen where you've been or you can use the GPS tracker to locate you. You can record nil fine data, which was vital. You can record, you know, population polygons and um, there's drop-down menus to record all the technical information. So volunteers could... In, um, put in as much information as they could. Um, and even some of the staff from DBCA have started to use this now because they think it's way easier than their systems. So that's really great. Um, yeah, and you can also, you know, they could even just do simple things about taking a photo of the plant, taking a photo of people searching, anything they wanted to, and all of that data um, was collected uh, spatially and joined to that data and it all sits uh, once they go back into uh, Wi-Fi range it all uploads and sits with the department's GIS system so that in the future people doing research on these species if they want to know where it's been searched or if they're looking at listing it all that information is not lost and we're not wasting people's time <laughs> that's some staff from DBCA enjoying themselves learning how to use the app um, so what we've achieved so far, um, 77 volunteers participated in 50 survey events last spring. Um, so probably should just say most of our flowering is within really two months in the southwest, so we need to be everywhere at once. So to have all those volleys on the ground was huge. We could really cover a lot more area. Um, and we did about 55 training sessions leading up to... Oh, sorry, we had 55 people come to training sessions leading up to that. We did it in groups and we, and we went out in the field, sometimes one-on-one, -on -one where that was needed and several times where people were a bit nervous about the technology, but I think everyone's getting it now. Um, yeah, so out of the 77 volunteers that actually actively participated, 44 people participated more than once, which is really what we want. We really wanted to give people all the tools and information and every, the skills and everything that they need to be able to continue to do this long term because there's so much, so much work needed. Um, and this is a photo of some of my volunteers um, celebrating their first find. It was initially quite difficult to get volunteers to appreciate the importance of nil find data. So we were going out, you know, weekend after weekend and traipsing around in the heat and the flies and the ticks and, and then they're not finding anything. And I just kept reiterating to them that you know, not finding anything is just important. Maybe that means this plant is truly, you know, critically endangered and the only population we've seen is that one on the roadside. And then um, the first time we found a population, some of the volunteers said, oh no, so what's wrong? Oh, well, now we've found it, they probably won't protect it. Like, no, <laughs> I've gone too far the other way. So, um, yeah, I, I got super excited when we found this little trigger, this little trigger plant and got, gave them the idea that, wow, this is awesome, you know, now there's some hope for the plant because we haven't just found it in the gravel reserve, it's, it's you know, now we've found it in conservation estates. So that's really great. Um, and throughout the project uh, last spring, we... Uh, together we discovered 23 new populations of rare and poorly known species, which was awesome for just one season. Um, and we estimated the volunteer contribution so far at about $35,500, which is an amazing um, input to the project. Um, and yeah, that's so far, so we're continuing. So unfortunately our funding runs out at the end of um, this financial year. So the next six months is really, or five months now, is really just about making sure that people have everything that they need to continue, making sure that they've got all the equipment they need, reimbursing people for fuel if they've been travelling all over the place because it is a big state. Um, 
We're going to produce at least another 25 fact sheets so that there's together there'll be 50 species, which isn't much out of the thousand species that we need to do this for, but it's a place to start. Um, and also we need to advocate for continued support. Um, I think that's a real lack with a lot of projects. Um, I think most people here are involved in projects where they're um, you know, mostly a paid person supporting community. And I think that's such an important thing and there's less and less funding available for that. So um, yeah, we need to recognise that need to provide ongoing support. And you know, that might not be me, that doesn't need to be me. It might be the Wildflower Society, it might be uh, DBCA actually taking that on themselves. That's what we'll be advocating for and talking to partners about what's possible so that they can continue to support these people. Because it always takes a while with citizen science to build that momentum, get people engaged and get people you know, in the swing of how you do things or, or what data you need to collect. So it's a real shame with these short funding cycles to be losing that so we'll be doing whatever we can to help these people continue. So yeah I just wanted to say thank you to uh, the state NRM for their wonderful grant and all the um, positive contributions from the Wildflower Society of WA and their volunteers and the Department of Biodiversity Conservation and Attractions and the Wet and Hall Environmental Trust actually funded our initial pilot so thanks very much.